April 1981. Columbia, the first space shuttle orbiter, glides to a pinpoint landing at Edwards Air Force Base, California, ending its spectacular maiden flight. But unlike spacecraft that had gone before, Columbia would not be retired from service to become a museum piece. Its future as a space transport vehicle had only begun. After its successful first flight, Columbia was ferried back to Kennedy Space Center. There, the process of turnaround was set in motion. There were system checkouts, minor tile repairs and replacements. An experiments package called OSTA-1 was placed in the payload bay. The package rests on a platform built by the European Space Agency. The Canadian-built remote manipulator system was installed. The system includes a 50-foot-long mechanical arm. In early August, Columbia was moved over to the Vehicle Assembly Building. Here it was mated to two new solid rocket boosters and an external fuel tank. Three weeks later, it was rolled to the launch pad once again. Shuttle Flight 1 brought many firsts. Shuttle Flight 2 would bring another. The first time in the history of space flight that an attempt would be made to launch the same spacecraft a second time. During the next three weeks, launch preparation crews worked in three shifts trying to meet the early October launch date. All had gone smoothly up to the point of loading the hypergolic fuels. That process had barely begun when nitrogen tetroxide was discovered spilling onto the orbiter. Approximately 15 to 20 gallons of the oxidizer had spilled down the side of the vehicle and into the propellant tank compartment of the nose section. It had also seeped between the orbiter's thermal protection system tiles and dissolved the bond holding the tiles on the spacecraft. Eventually, over 350 had to be removed. The cause of the spill was failure of a quick disconnect valve to close. The valve could not close because of concentrations of iron nitrate in the head and hardening of lubrication in that area. With Columbia still on the launch pad, workers were able to gain access inside the nose compartment and replace soaked thermal blankets. They were also able to reach the soaked tiles. Therefore, it would not be necessary to move back to the orbiter processing facility for repairs. The tiles were put through a very speedy decontamination process to remove the oxidizer. Within three weeks after the spill, all 378 tiles had been removed, decontaminated, and rebonded. Launch was rescheduled for November 4th. But Columbia was not destined to return to space yet. Only 31 seconds away from ignition, the launch computer halted the countdown. The pressure in the liquid oxygen tank was below the predetermined limit necessary for liftoff. Meanwhile, controllers were also becoming increasingly concerned about the high oil pressure in two of the three auxiliary power units. After analyzing this problem further, they decided to scrub the launch for the day. The APUs are vital to Columbia's safe ascent and entry for steering the engines during liftoff, controlling the aero surfaces during landing, and for lowering the landing gear. It was suspected that oil pressure rose in the units because the filters were clogged. The problem would have to be solved before another launch. Analysis revealed that a wax-like substance had formed in the oil to clog the filters. 
the substance was created by a chemical reaction between the oil and hydrazine fuel. The hydrazine seeped into the gearbox over the seven month period since the APUs were last used and contaminated the oil. Although many thought technicians simply forgot to change the oil, normal maintenance procedures did not require it. Indeed, a key factor in shuttles reusability is quick turnaround with minimum maintenance. The APUs were flushed with new lube oil. New filters were installed and fresh oil was added. Working on a very tight schedule, ground crews completed the work within a week. The shuttle was again ready to be launched. Astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly, commander and pilot for the second shuttle flight. Commander Engel, who joined NASA in 1966, was part of the backup crew for Apollo 14 and the first shuttle flight. Three of his 16 X-15 flights went above 50 miles, qualifying him for astronaut rank. But he had not yet been in orbit. Nor had Richard Truly, pilot for this flight. Truly, who joined NASA in 1969, was capsule communicator for three Skylab missions and the Apollo-Soyuz mission. He was also part of the backup crew for Columbia's first flight. Both men had flown the shuttle before, in approach and landing tests at Dryden Flight Research Center in 1977. That was over four years ago. It was now 1981, November 12th to be exact, Richard Truly's 44th birthday. Countdown now being conducted by the launch sequencers on board the orbiter. The SRB nozzles have been moved to start position. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. We have go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Go 
Okay, Houston, we got a good Miko. Miko. Roger, we got Miko. Roger, Miko. And we got a Miko confirmed. And confirmed. Let's get off the tank now. Got the Miami Bites flight. flight. No problem. Ignore them. Okay. Ignore the IMU Bites, Capcom. Columbia, Houston, you can ignore the IMU Bites. Roger, Houston, and we've had ET SEP. Roger on the SEP. Okay, let's get an Holmes 1 status here. On the nominal Delta V, 141. Roger, Holmes 1 status. Booster? Go. Prop? Go. Ecom? Go. GNC? Go. Capcom, we're go for nominal Holmes 1. Go for APU off. Columbia, Houston, uh, your go for nominal Holmes 1. For APU shutdown on time. Okay, Dan, and we'll maneuver to attitude now. Roger. As Columbia continued toward orbit, the SRVs parachuted to a safe landing in the Atlantic Ocean, 160 miles downrange from the launch site. They were recovered and will be used again on a later shuttle flight. All orbital maneuvering system burns were successful, putting Columbia into a 138-mile orbit around the Earth. The payload bay doors were opened to deploy the heat dissipating radiators and expose the OSTA experiments. So began the many tasks of the five day mission that lay ahead. However, not long after achieving orbit, at about two hours, 27 minutes mission elapsed time, the crew reported a high pH level indicating alkalinity in one of Columbia's three fuel cells. The cells which produce electricity and water for the spacecraft and crew are essential for operating the many systems on board. Flight controllers, having dealt with almost every conceivable problem during flight simulations, immediately began working to find a real-time solution to this problem. But meanwhile, the cell's capacity to generate electricity continued to deteriorate. At about five hours mission elapsed time, it was decided to take the fuel cell offline and safe it, drain it of all its energy. This would prevent a potentially dangerous reaction from occurring that could damage the spacecraft. But according to a mission rule made pre-flight, the failure of a fuel cell would reduce the 125-hour nominal mission to a 54-hour minimum mission. A mission management meeting was held to decide whether to enforce or override the rule, whether to come home after 54 hours or stay up for the full duration. At a press conference on day two of the mission, Johnson Space Center Director Christopher Kraft explained why the decision was finally made to shorten the mission. Well, we certainly don't have any other problems on board. I think that we think it's the prudent thing to do uh, at this point in our test program. Uh, we think we can really get everything out of the mission that we have planned uh, with, the ex with the exception of time. So we just felt from a more prudent position, uh, we, had, we had thought it out very carefully uh, pre-flight that uh, that was the best thing for us to do. Indeed, virtually everything was gotten out of the mission that was planned. All high priority objectives were accomplished and 90% of the overall objectives were completed, even though this was a test vehicle on a developmental flight cut short 71 hours. Of top priority were the remote manipulator system tests completed on the morning of day two. Sally Ride, first female capsule communicator guided the astronauts through the tests. And we've got a great picture from camera delta of the arm going down into the cradle. Hey, good. I tell you, the old eyeball looking out the window is the best alignment device, I think. And now we got a picture of the PLT moving the arm. The RMS, which is a major subsystem of the orbiter, is designed to deploy and retrieve satellites and other payloads in operational flights. 
Although the arm did not actually grapple a payload, the end effector was able to come within six inches of the target and maintain that position. Two very important objectives of the test. You can do that if, uh, if you get it locked up. Okay, we'll do that. We've got a picture of the flag back and we'll coordinate with ENCO. Super. Incidentally, uh, Houston, one of the things that has surprised me at least, I didn't think it'd be this way, but we have not felt the RMS move, move the orbiter at all. Okay, we copy that. Columbia, Houston, we've got the, uh, we've got the elbow camera. Okay. Hi, Mom. <laughs> In addition, all five operating modes of the system were evaluated, ranging from manual operation by the astronauts to a completely computer-controlled operation. The three and a half hours of tests done on the arm proved highly successful. A real tribute to the designer, the National Research Council of Canada, and the builder, Spar Aerospace Limited. Canada absorbed all expenses related to research and development of this first system. The first package of scientific instruments to be flown on shuttle from NASA's Office of Space and Terrestrial Applications was designated OSTA-1. Although all the visual results are not yet available from the shuttle data takes, each experiment has already flown on aircraft or satellites. The shuttle imaging radar instrument used side-looking radar to create map-like images of the Earth's surface, showing relief. When supplemented with previously recorded Landsat satellite data, which could identify rocks and vegetation types, the composite revealed geological structures of a type which could possibly contain valuable mineral deposits, such as oil. With the OSTA experiments mounted in the payload bay of Space Shuttle Columbia at an altitude of 160 miles, worldwide data was obtained, proving that sensors previously used on costly individual satellites could now be flown in groups on shuttle, along with low-cost commercial-grade sensors that could only be flown on aircraft before. This will greatly reduce the cost of such experimentation in the future putting it within reach of low-budget researchers. The ability to map Earth from space also demonstrated the potential for these instruments to map other planets, yet unexplored, even through dense cloud cover, as the shuttle imaging radar experiment was able to do. At the end of the second day, Mission Control had a special visitor. Joe, Dick, this is Ronald Reagan. Hello, Mr. President. Let me just say, I'm sure you know how proud everyone down here is and how this whole nation, I'm sure the world, but certainly America, has got its eyes and its heart uh, on you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. We're, uh, we're awfully... Uh, honored that we've got the opportunity to uh, to take part in this. We certainly do appreciate uh, you taking the trouble to show all the people working on the space shuttle how much you care, and it makes us mighty proud. Well, I care, and again, God bless you both, and all of us here are watching with great pride. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. With all the Priority One objectives completed, the crew was ready to come home. Entry and landing would be their last test. We're seven minutes, over. Roger, and the port door is coming closed, and I want to at least get it close here and stop and then we can talk. Okay, that sounds good, Richard. Scale operators, assume all of you have checked the configuration. I'd like to come around the horn and get a go-no-go -go for the deal, but burn. Fido? Go. Guidance. I'm um, go. He's still maneuvering with attitude. Understand. DPS? We're go flight. Eagle. Command? Go. Ecom? Go. Eagle? Go. GNC? Go. 
Prop. Go. Booster. Go. Surgeon. Go. Enco. Go. Ops. FAO. Go. Head on. Go. Head arrow. Go. Okay, Capcom. Columbia Houston, we have a go for the deorbit burn. Three minutes remaining in this pass. Super, thank you, Rick. The landing, like the first mission, would be at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Entry on this mission would test the vehicle's response to maneuvers not performed before. And the roll reversals will still be as updated. At Columbia Houston, the uh, roll reversals will uh, still be as brief. Uh, there will be no significant effect on that uh, early turn on the first roll reversal. Over. Roger, understand. Thanks, Rick. The first maneuver, done at the beginning of the communications blackout, was executed at Mach 24, the fastest speed at which manual control had ever been exercised in winged aerodynamic flight. Close to 30 maneuvers took place as the shuttle sliced through the atmosphere at speeds from Mach 26 down to Mach 11. At about Mach 10 and a half, Columbia was expected to regain communications with mission control. Columbia Houston through Buckhorn, configure AOS. You're about 25 miles south of ground track. Your nav is good. Your energy is good. We'd like you to check your TACAN, MLS, and radar altimeters on. Over. Okay, Rick, good to hear you. And we're showing 10.5 mark and 165,000 feet now. Roger, everything's looking good. Your energy is very good. The nav is good. The first visual sighting of Columbia was aided by plumes from reaction control system jets, which were fired during a pitch maneuver. 100,000 feet, Mach 3.6. You have positive seats. We have a wind update for you and a weather update. Uh, you've got a very thin layer at 25,000. The winds airborne are as briefed and on the ground 220, 18 knots, gusting to 24. Hey, good. Sounds like a good old Eddie day. Let me, Houston, we show you intercepting the hack. And a reminder, you've got the strong winds out of the west. Now out of 38,000 feet. Okay, thank you, Rick. And Rick, the maneuvers have been going very good. The bird is real solid. Good, solid bird all the way. Well, we love hearing it. Coming close. Roger, slightly below glide slope. You have a go for auto land. Okay, Rick. Thank you, sir. Okay, Rick. We're in auto. Check speed brake auto. Okay, speed brake, body flap auto. Everything's auto. Thank you. Okay, 2,500 feet, speed brakes are closed, we're at 270 knots. Chase conversion. Columbia is clear land, link at 2-3, wind 2 one zero eight. Okay. Gear's coming. Three down. Okay, 
100, 50, 30, 20, 10, 5, 3, touchdown. Nose gear 15. Columbia has rolled her stop, and we're getting into the post landing. Okay, Joe, it's a great day for the Ace Moving Company. Welcome home. Although this second shuttle flight only lasted two and a half of the five and a half days planned, it did answer some formidable questions. The orbiter is truly a reusable spacecraft that can be launched again and again. Instruments in the payload bay can map Earth's resources on a global scale. And the remote manipulator system has met this flight's test objectives. The completion of this flight marks the halfway point in the shuttle flight test program. Columbia's third flight, a mission of up to seven days duration, is scheduled for the spring of 1982. The problems encountered so far are not unexpected during developmental flight testing. Indeed, it is only through such testing that confidence in the vehicle, its systems, and its flying characteristics can be built. The Columbia is a totally new concept in manned spaceflight. It needs very conservative, very comprehensive testing before it can become operational, making access to space something it's never been before. Routine. <laughs> 